Winchester, an important name in the history of firearms, and one that the pages of history will tell is associated with death. From the chapters of the Winchester Company's history, were led to its true heir apparent, one who, after the death of her husband, inherited the fortune of the family and, on orders from that deceased husband, went on to construct one of the most iconic architectural marvels in existence. She shut herself away, choosing to focus on the continuous construction project, and many rumors began to spread of the superstitious woman who lived in a strange house and communed nightly with spirits, those who spurred her ever onward in the construction of the confounding maze she called home. I'm Nick, your host, and this is Chapter 36 of the Insidious Agenda podcast titled Sarah's Labyrinth, The Winchester Mystery House. Our story begins on the 1st of September in 1839 with the birth of Sarah Lockwood Parody, the daughter of Leonard and Sarah Parody, a highly respected upper middle class couple living in New Haven. Sarah's father was the manager of the bathhouse in New Haven and had a great amount of skill in carpentry. Eventually, he left employment in the bathhouse and pursued further employment in the construction field as a Finnish carpenter and carriage manufacturer. He amassed a great amount of wealth during the U.S. Civil War, as Finnish carpentry was a vocation that allowed him to create and sell field ambulances. Leonard Parody was also a progressive. He opened his home to persons of the abolitionist movement and many modern philosophers of his day. Because of her upbringing, in this environment with various groups of intellectuals, Sarah, too, became a bright young student. One of the notable things she studied were languages, coming to inherit a great amount of linguistic proficiency. With a prodigal level knowledge of the English language by the time she was only 12, Sarah was also fluent in French, Spanish, Italian, and Latin. To go along with her linguistic talents, Sarah was also a gifted musician and was considered to be quite striking. She was so beautiful, in fact, that the New Haven Society gave her the name the Belle of New Haven. Living in New Haven, Sarah was exposed to the students and faculty of Ivy League mainstay Yale University. She was even so fortunate as to have the opportunity to attend the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute, the only institution for higher education that women as young as she could attend at the time. Here, Sarah focused her studies on science and mathematics. She was also exposed to the theology of Rosicrucianism and the teachings of the Freemasons, as many members of her family were members. She was also a close friend of students Susan and Rebecca Bacon, two others at the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute. The Bacon family were vaulted into fame through the literary works of their aunt Delia, who went on to work with authors like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Mark Twain, and was known for her critique of Shakespeare's works. Through this connection, and her family's association with the Freemasons, Sarah was exposed to Baconian Masonic techniques that included secret encryptions and ciphers, pairing them with Rosicrucian symbology. Sarah's view of the world was what was known as Kabbalistic Theosophy, the belief that the world is a living organism in which all things continue to evolve individually as part of one universal body, 
one that is ever growing. The party family, being of a well-off status, had become well acquainted with Oliver Fisher and Jane Ellen Hope, the Winchester family. Their son, William Wirt, named after the longest-serving Attorney General of the United States, was born in Baltimore, Maryland on the 22nd of July in 1837. This made him only two years senior to Sarah. Oliver Winchester made his fortune through smart business dealings and profits in his clothing company, the Winchester Davies Shirt Manufactory, a business that brought both he and his family great fortune. Shortly after the birth of William, the family moved to New Haven and became mainstay in local society. Wanting to get into a field more profitable, Oliver funneled a considerable amount of capital into a new company, focusing on the manufacture of firearms. The Volcanic Arms Company, one that, in 1866, would become the world-famous Winchester Repeating Arms Company. William became the heir apparent to the company after selling his stake in his father's shirt business and took the position of secretary with the new venture. William and Sarah had become acquainted through their church, the First Baptist Church of New Haven, and through William's sister Annie, who attended the Ladies' Collegiate Institute with Sarah. The two shared a number of similarities. William studied at another arm of Yale, and they were exposed to the same faculty, and much of the same teaching and doctrine was impressed upon them. In addition, many of William's family, like Sarah's, were sworn Freemasons. The couple courted, and eventually were married, on September 30th in 1862. Not much is known about their marriage, but the couple were blessed with one child. Annie Party Winchester was born on the 15th of June in 1866. Shortly after her birth, Annie was diagnosed with marasmus, a disorder of the body that prevents food from being digested properly, not allowing the body to take in enough protein. Only 40 days after her birth, on the 25th of July, Annie was taken to heaven essentially passing away from malnutrition. This was the first of many tragedies that occurred in the life of Sarah Winchester. Only ten years after Annie's passing, the Winchester Repeating Arms Company made a breakthrough in their field. They had invented the gun that won the West, the Model 1873 Lever Action Winchester Repeater, a weapon in which Winchester would sell 700,000 units over the next 40 years. Less than a decade later, tragedy once again befell Sarah. In the span of months between the fall of 1880 and the spring of 1881, she lost her mother, her father-in-law, and finally, after a short battle with tuberculosis, William passed away at the age of 43. As Oliver had left everything he invested in the company to his son, and William had left everything to Sarah, she became the heir apparent to the fortune of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. That inheritance was to the tune of $20 million. In addition, she would now hold almost half of all stock the company had. To put this in perspective, $20 million in 1881 by today's standards, is just shy of $600 million. For the rest of her life, Sarah made, in royalties, the sum of $1,000 per day, or again, by modern standard, $27,000. And this she would collect every day, as long as she was living. Sarah Winchester gained everything she would ever need at the cost of everything she ever loved, making her, at the same time, one of the most wealthy women in the world, and, likely, one of the saddest. So, when you've lost everything, where do you go? As an intellectual, Sarah wouldn't head to a tavern, but instead turn to a medium, a somewhat common practice for women of the time. It's important to remember here 
that for the sixty years preceding her various tragedies, there was one movement that began to take hold in the eastern United States. This was the rise of spiritualism, and with it, mediumship, and the belief that spirits could communicate with those still living. Spiritualism a belief that began with the practices and seances of the Fox sisters, Maggie and Kate, whose tragic story I told you all the way back in Chapter 9. Shortly after the death of her husband, Sarah took a sojourn to Europe, returning sometime in 1884. As to where exactly she went, or what she did during this period, historical records do not tell. We can infer that with the background of her education and her linguistic skills, that it was likely she studied further, possibly into the Freemasons, or the Knights Templar, or other societies and ritualistic practices. Those desires, paired with the fact she spoke near half the continent's languages, would have made it extremely easy to get around. After returning, Sarah did seek the assistance of a medium named Adam Coons in Boston. With the assistance and presence of Sarah, the medium was able to channel the relaying of messages from her deceased love, William. William's message to Sarah was not really a message at all, but more of a mission. One which was to leave New Haven and travel west to California. Here, she was to construct a home with all of the money she inherited. But surely, this couldn't be a home for Sarah alone. Not at all, for William intended her to build a house as a home for wayward spirits, those who had died at the business end of a Winchester rifle. He told her this was because she got rich off the blood those weapons bought and that those spirits would seek her out as the inheritant. If she did not heed this direction, they would haunt her for the rest of her life. With the mission, William also gave Sarah a warning that construction on the house could never stop. If you continue building, you will live, he said. Stop, and you will die. Now let's step back and take a look at this moment in time, just for a second. Put yourself in Sarah's shoes. You've gone through unimaginable tragedy, losing many people closest to you, least of all, the love of your life. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, could you imagine someone contacting that person opposite the veil and relaying messages to you from them? There is no question you're going to heed every single word of that. Convinced she was following the plan laid on for her by William, Sarah did as she was instructed. In 1886, Sarah set out for California, accompanied by Edward Rambo, an agent from Winchester who was serving in the Bay Area. For those who don't know that term, the Bay Area is in reference to San Francisco. Nestled in amongst beautiful old orchards, Sarah purchased a small, twin-level farmhouse on a 45-acre ranch in the city of San Jose, in the area known today as Los Altos. The property was named La Nada Villa. This was an area already stockpiled with party family members, mainly those who left the East Coast for the Sunshine State during the gold rush of 1849. One of these was noteworthy doctor turned politician Enoch Purdy. Enoch's son George later rose to prominence as well, serving a term as the governor of California in the early 20th century. History believes both Enoch and George to be occultists. They were part of a secret club known as the Bohemian Club, an offshoot chapter of the Skull and Bone Society of Yale University. Like many members of the family in New Haven, they were also involved with the Freemasons. Keep in mind the recurring themes you've heard in Sarah's story already. Occultism, Freemason teachings, secret societies, etc. 
In 1888, Sarah began creating the impossible, a house that never ended construction or renovation. Sarah hired on a crew of carpenters, around 20 or so, to renovate and add on to the house where they worked 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. They worked and they built. They worked in shifts so as to never stop. Per Sarah's direction to them, they constructed an architectural marvel. Curious enough, they never used a single blueprint. For the next 36 years, they turned the eight-room house into 160. At the end, the house was 24,000 square feet, had 10,000 windows, 2,000 doors, not all of which you can walk through, 52 skylights, 47 stairways and fireplaces, 17 chimneys, 13 bathrooms, of which only one worked, 7 stories, 6 kitchens, 3 elevators, 2 hydraulic and 1 electric, and 2 basements, in all costing her the sum of $5.5 million. In addition to the carpenters, Sarah also had a staff of 18 servants and 18 gardeners. Each and every morning, she met with the construction foreman to go over the plans for the day. How Sarah would dream up these plans, I'll get to in just a little bit. It was because they never had a single blueprint that everything was constructed in strange fashion. New additions were added on to existing rooms with exterior walls. So in some locations, windows which once gazed upon the property now only looked into an adjoining room. Stairways were constructed, some of which went nowhere, and all had different risers, so as to offer a distorted appearance, like something you'd find in a Tim Burton movie. Every bit of construction, again, per Sarah's insistence, was that each renovation be done in redwood, even more bizarre was that Sarah hated the look of it, and she had it all covered in stain and finished with a faux grain. Some of the doors were peculiar, in the sense that, as mentioned before, they went nowhere. One door led to an eight-foot drop into a kitchen sink below. Another, a fifteen-foot drop into the bushes outside. Its hallways became a labyrinth through which one never knew which way to go. There were skylights on top of skylights, skylights in the floor, and some that would only show you a view of a ceiling above. In 1898, Sarah wrote to her sister-in-law, I am constantly having to make an upheaval for some reason. For instance, my upper hall which leads to the sleeping apartment, was rendered so unexpectedly dark by a little addition that after a number of people had missed their footing on the stairs, I decided that safety demanded something be done. But this was no simple constructed shell for wayward and potentially murderous spirits, but Sarah turned it into a spectacle. Chandeliers of gold and silver from Germany adorned the ceilings above. Beneath your feet are inlaid parquet flooring of teak, maple, and mahogany. The rooms were filled with furniture from the Orient. On the walls were paintings from France, and looking out of the rooms were stained glass windows. Some had come all the way from Austria, while others were handcrafted by Tiffany and Company, some of which were actually done by Louis Comfort Tiffany, the founder. Many of these windows were installed in locations where no natural light came in, so one would never get to experience their beauty. One window that was designed by Tiffany was meant to have a prismatic rainbow effect. Since it was inside, it would never be seen. Sarah's home was also technologically superior and very modern for the time. She had indoor plumbing. To the envy of the neighborhood, it had hot, running water and push-button carbide gas lighting. 
it was heated by forced air throughout. Continuing as an extremely modern state of living, Sarah's home is also believed to be the first to make use of wool as insulation. The house even had an indoor shower, an annunciator intercom system, plumbing and electrical workshops, a generator to supply water and electricity, and even its own sewage drainage system. To add on to peculiarity, Sarah even had a full indoor garden, which was built on top of slanted floors. This was because, as the garden was watered, any excess would run out below and water the flowers outside. As you look more closely, you begin to see recurring themes. In the numbers of windows in the rooms, spindles and staircases, or panels in the floor, the prime numbers 7, 11, and 13 are found, with Sarah being particularly fond of 13. These obviously held significance for Sarah, and tied in with some of her Baconian learnings in her youth. She held very high standards for the house, choosing to go room by room, one at a time. If a room did not meet her expectations, she was not afraid to have it stripped to the studs and start over. Take, for example, the seven-story tower that once existed on the property. Sarah had it torn down and rebuilt 16 times over. She was joined in the house in 1890 when she invited her niece Daisy Merriman to come and stay with her. Daisy agreed and took up the position of administrative assistant to Sarah, looking after all of the business correspondence and finances. Together, the pair were members of various charities, including associated charities, and were paying members of the Red Cross. When Daisy wed her beloved Frank Marriott III in 1903, Sarah covered the cost of the wedding. As a gift, she offered the couple one of the many properties she had recently purchased in the area, a proposition they accepted. In 1906, tragedy struck the area of San Francisco. There was a great earthquake which struck the area and hit Sarah's home just as hard as everyone else. Fortunately, the house was built on what's known as a floating foundation, where the foundation weighs just as much as the soil surrounding it. Sarah, who was staying in the daisy room, known for its floral theme in the windows, became trapped by debris outside the door. She had to be dug out by members of her staff, who heard her ringing a bell. The earthquake scared her something awful. The tower on the property collapsed. The main building itself sustained extensive damage, some of which can still be seen today. As a result, Sarah had a plethora of rooms closed or cordoned off. She also ordered the tearing down of the top three floors of the house so that only four of the seven remained, the four which remain with the house today. Sarah also ordered the majority of the unfinished parts of the house to be sealed off, due to high damage. Because of its state of disrepair, Sarah was forced to move back into her farmhouse, La Nada Villa, where she would live out the rest of her life. In her later years, particularly after 1900, Sarah was the victim of a number of ailments. She suffered from arthritis, neuritis, and even many dental issues which caused her to lose a number of teeth. These ailments contributed to her living a life of solitude and loneliness. I should note that the earthquake didn't stop the work from being done to the house, but only slowed it down a little bit. Some repairs were made to a good many locations, and renovation continued as Sarah still needed to heed William's warning. She took the earthquake as a sign from spirits that the house was potentially nearing completion, and it was this intervention that she would need to spur her forward with new construction, albeit, of course, less than a breakneck pace. After the earthquake, it was really mainly maintenance and attempting to recover from it. Sarah spent much of her time engaged in finance and building an investment portfolio, and was never invested in the house as much as she had been before. 
After the earthquake, Sarah bought and also kept a houseboat in Burlingame in San Francisco Bay. The houseboat was nicknamed Sarah's Ark, and she had it in the event there was another great flood, one of biblical proportions. The boat existed until 1929, when it was destroyed by a fire. In the 36 years of construction since Sarah started, only one single day did the noise of construction stop, the 5th of September in 1922. At 10.45 p.m., Sarah Winchester died of heart failure. The carpenters, who were on shift that night, high-tailed it out of there, leaving work, including half-hammered nails, unfinished, and never returned. When Sarah's twelve-page long will was read, which was broken into thirteen sections and signed thirteen times, she had left a great amount of her estate to charities. She ensured that some of it was dispensed to her workers, and the remainder was left to her niece Marion. Well, everything except for the house itself, which peculiarly is never mentioned. Sarah's remains stayed at the Ulta Mesa Cemetery until they were finally transferred to her family home in New Haven, where they rest today. Marion brought in various appraisers, but due to the home's inhabitability, it was deemed worthless. Marion spent the next six weeks, and this is still a contestable theory, having removed everything from the house and began auctioning it off. When the house was empty, Marion sold it to a group of investors for the sum of $135,000. This group leased it to John and Mame Brown, who determined that the house was too incredible to sit idle. So, they decided to turn it into a tourist attraction. They refurnished parts of it, did repairs that were necessary, and even added on new rooms and removed others. All of this taking place after Sarah's death, of course. In February of 1923, only five short months after Sarah's death, the house was open to tourists. Many of the dark stories of Sarah Winchester that were told to the public by the Browns were refuted, mainly by those who had worked for Sarah for decades and were upset they were making money hand over fist by tarnishing and spreading falsehoods about Sarah and what went on inside. But there's a lot more to uncover here, and I'm certainly not going to leave it untouched before we draw the curtain on this episode. Because Sarah's former employees had such a negative reaction to the Browns' portrayal of her, we need to examine the story that I just told you and separate the fact from fiction, or simply to bring it back to reality. As much of the story I just told you is what's pushed today in existing literature, or on tours if you ever decide to take a trip to see the house yourself. The first thing we have to examine is the death of William Winchester and the fallout with Sarah's inheritance. It was believed that Sarah inherited $20 million, a truckload of stock in the Winchester Company, and received $1,000 per day in royalties. In Mary Jo Ignafo's book, Captive of the Labyrinth, she estimates that William's fortune was only around $362,000 at the time of his death. The stock was only worth around $300,000, but as Oliver Winchester's will passed it to his wife, Sarah didn't actually see any of that until 1898, when her mother-in-law passed. Sarah's shares which totaled 777 total, were valued at $77,700, and only would have paid her 10% of that in royalties annually. The turning point in Sarah's story, when she met with medium Adam Coons, Sarah was informed that her family was tormented by those who had lost their lives to Winchester weapons. This was an idea brought forward by author Susie Smith, in her 1967 book, Prominent American Ghosts. Ignafo notes that although it was common practice for women at the time, the height of spirituality, 
to meet with mediums and help work through things, there was no evidence of her traveling to Boston to meet with Coons. But it wasn't just Smith that brought this forward, as local newspapers, even as early as 1895, were printing headlines like this in the San Jose Daily News. Strange story. A woman who thinks she'll die when her house is built. Ten years ago, the handsome residence was apparently ready for occupancy. But improvements and additions are constantly being made, for the reason, it is said, that the owner of the house believes that when it is entirely completed, she will die. The superstition has resulted in the construction of a maze of domes and turrets, cupolas and towers covering territory enough for a castle. The sheer coincidence of the only day the construction stopped was also a myth, as construction had stopped for an entire week in 1915, as the majority of the staff chose to attend the Panama Pacific International Expo in San Francisco. There was also no evidence that anything was done during that period, as Sarah also wasn't preoccupied with it, and instead chose to focus on finance. In addition to this, documented letters from Sarah often mentioned that she would suspend construction in the summer, when it got too hot for the workers, and even during the winter, when it got too cold, and the carpenters, as well as Sarah, simply needed a rest. This happened at a number of points as her ailing health did her no favors, like pressing on through seasonal austere conditions would have only made it worse. I'm not going to dispel and disprove everything, because Sarah isolated herself, much is left to mystery. She wasn't alone to the point of being a recluse. She was merely hyper-focused and mission-oriented. She chose to further her goal and her mission during the time she was living in the mystery house. As many high society and wealthy people of the time would often attend events and galas and would spend much of their fortune showing off and donating, Sarah much preferred the quiet life, surrounded only by her family, like her niece Marion. Because locals around her knew relatively nothing about her, where there was nothing, they had to begin filling in gaps in her story, quite often to the point of pure conjecture. Really, after her death, they had nothing to go on. Sarah wrote or left behind no journals, no explanations for keeping to herself, and no opinions or explanations for her behavior were ever given by any of her family members. In Colin Dickey's book, Ghostland, he takes the rumors as evidence that they were trying to make Sarah into a villain. The late 1800s brought a multi-year, long depression and unemployment rates peaked around 40%. She was a martyr, the perfect person to exemplify to the people the difference between the haves and have-nots of the world. Also, the constant construction and teardown and reconstruction only made her appear worse to them due to the wastefulness of resources. They used her reputation to serve a purpose, as in 1922 when she passed away, there was no near mention of the passing of Sarah Winchester, who, at this time, was still possibly the most wealthy woman in America. Don't get me wrong, there were those sources that were on her side, so it wasn't all doom and gloom for her reputation. The Mill Valley Record printed the following about Sarah and her charitable nature after her passing. A few days ago, a quiet woman went quietly out of life leaving a fortune of some millions, all of it for philanthropy. She had no children, so she gave her stocks and bonds, her wealth of whatever form to the public in the most advantageous manner possible. This woman was Mrs. Winchester. How many thousands of lives will be blessed by Mrs. Winchester's bequest? Yet, the newspaper accounts of her going and its attendant circumstances were brief and unadorned. Her lawyer, Samuel Leib, also sang her praises, dispelling the idea that she was a crazed old woman. She was as sane and clear-headed a woman as I have ever known, and she had a better grasp of business and financial affairs than most men. During her life, Sarah also had a hospital built in the name of her husband, 
She was a paladin in society, and it's sad to see her reputation tarnished. Nonetheless, many whispers of dark dealings crept in of her true involvement with spirits. I'll mention, these are a few stories told about Sarah Winchester and her house, so take from them what you will. I'm a believer, and I love to hear these stories, so whether they're grounded in fact or fabrication, it's always fun to believe and immerse yourself in the world, even if only for a few minutes. The first piece is the most spoken about, that Sarah received a message from her deceased husband telling her to begin ever-progressing construction on the house she would live in. I also mentioned previously that Sarah met with the construction foreman each morning to go over the plans for the day, and that she had to receive the direction from somewhere. Well, this direction was supernatural in nature as well. For every night, at midnight, Sarah would make her way to the blue room, and in the house, or some closet. And if the mood would strike her right, possibly some other strange location. She would begin ringing a bell to signify to the spirits that it was midnight, and thus time to begin their ritual seance. Over the course of the next two hours, they would go over plans with her and issue tasks for the next day's construction projects. At 2 a.m., she rang the bells again to signify that the seance was over and she would turn in for the night. Upon waking, she issued that direction to the foreman, who would see the work was complete. The second is the labyrinth-style construction of the house itself. Folklore states, following on with the House of Wayward Spirits theory, that Sarah began construction of new hallways and rooms in a pure unimaginable design so that the spirits would get lost inside trying to find her. For this was also the reason that she slept in a different bedroom in the house every night. The factual version of this is that Sarah did attempt to have drawn up plans for the house with the help of an architect. As she couldn't find an architect in any of the seven she tried that she saw eye to eye with, the plans were always wrong, and she fired each one of them before the construction began. She finally decided to design the renovations herself. It has since been proven that the Blue Room was the private quarters of one of Sarah's gardeners, making it unlikely that this was a dedicated seance room. The house itself is no stranger to rumors of the paranormal, and is even stalked by spirits. As with many purported haunted houses, some of the same phenomena occurs here that it does in most. Cold spots footsteps, strange smells and sounds, whispers from disembodied voices, the slamming of windows and doors, and the feeling of being watched. Important to remember that the house is a century old. It's gone through a great tragedy with the earthquake and was rebuilt. There are bound to be creaks and groans, drafts and loud noises. It's just the nature of an older home continuing to settle out. With the reputation that Sarah had, the feelings of being watched and whispers of voices are likely the result of many stories that were fabricated about her, and the narrative that was pushed by the Browns so many years ago. But with that, there have been a number of stories of ghostly visitors roaming the house and the property. One is a ghost named Clyde that often totes a wheelbarrow or a wooden toolbox and was one of Sarah's former employees. He's dressed in overalls, and in addition to being seen around the property, on occasion he's seen in one of the basements. He totes around his wheelbarrow, hence why he was given that nickname, the Wheelbarrow Ghost. After all these long years, and the death of his employer, he's still taking care of the house today. The Winchester Mystery House's historian, Janin Boheme, states that she in addition to many who are employed there today, claim to have felt the presence of Sarah still around the home. Many of the mediums and psychics that have been brought in to investigate say they have felt her presence, though she has never manifested. But fear not. Even in death, Boheme says she's a very kind spirit, and if you visit today, she's probably just moving around, 
keeping watch on her life's work, full of good energy, especially around the servants' quarters on the third floor. Albeit, sometimes she does exude an energy of sadness. As you know her story, now you know why. There's no real reason to feel afraid in the house, even with the spirits roaming around, as everyone was treated good there, and it was a positive experience for everyone. When you visit the house, she says you'll never feel alone, but the energy is so friendly you'll never feel terrified. I'll be honest, I learned a lot about the story of Sarah Winchester while conducting my research for the episode, and Sarah Winchester's story really does form a true duality with that of Delphine LaLaurie and her mansion that I mentioned in the last chapter. LaLaurie was horrible to those enslaved by her family. The inside of the home was negative and filled with so much dark energy and hatred carried out by a woman who was extremely well off. While on the other side, we have Sarah Winchester, whose story is tragic, sad, and I'll be honest, my heart completely bleeds for Sarah. Her home was filled with such creativity and vision, and though I didn't want to get too into the Rosicrucian and Freemason symbols that are littering that house, there is so much more to discover with her story. For those who want to dive deeper into the symbolism, check out the reference in the show notes titled The Truth About Sarah Winchester. She suffered so much in the earlier stages of her life after being a bright young woman destined for great things. She was turned into a mockery and stories were told about Sarah that weren't her at all. She was a kind bright woman who may or may not have been influenced by her deceased husband to build a home. With the tragedies she had been through, she lived the rest of her life giving to charity and trying to fend off the sadness that haunted her. Sarah Winchester was a beautiful soul, one that poured her heart into creating her home while she walked the earth, and one who, in spirit, continues to look after her house and welcome those who come to visit. I truly hope the words I've spoken in this episode do justice to Sarah's story and the wonderful, kind, philanthropic person that she was. She was simply someone trying to live her life and pick up the pieces from tragedy, a state of mind which we can all understand. So, if you ever find yourself in San Jose, make sure you stop into the Winchester Mystery House for a tour. Listen to the life of Sarah, keep in mind the truth, and marvel for a little while at her life's work, the work of Sarah Winchester. But on your tour, you won't be alone, and might just find yourself in the embrace of Sarah's friendly and welcoming energy. And if she taps you on the shoulder, she's just thanking you for coming to visit. With this message... I bring to close the tragic, sad, and creative tale of Sarah Winchester and her mystery house. I truly hope you enjoyed listening, and I hope you can take a few lessons away from Sarah's story, especially not judging a book by its cover. Before you go, please leave a little review or thumbs up. It supports the podcast and lets me know you like the episode. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you can find your way back for next week's exciting chapter, when I'll tell you the story of another great mystery of our world, the Ark of the Covenant. New episodes of the Insidious Agenda podcast release every Tuesday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. But for now, it's time to close the cover of the Insidious Agenda. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening, and stay mysterious.